in this section of the book, we're going to look at the multivariable Taylor polynomials and Taylor series. Hopefully you remember a lot of what you did in single variable calculus with, with Taylor polynomials and series. The basic idea is you have a function that's conceivably fairly complicated. And earlier we looked at linear approximation. In single variable calculus, you look at linear approximations for single variable functions. And earlier in multivariable calculus, we looked at linear approximations. But can you get higher order approximations? Maybe can you add um, some more terms in higher powers of x and y and get better approximations? And if you take an infinite number of terms, can you get rid of the word approximation and have some, this kind of infinite polynomial that actually equals the function you have in mind? Um, that's what Taylor polynomials and Taylor series are about. Um, I am going to quickly recall what happens in the single variable case to motivate um, the multivariable case. I should say that this section is probably the most technically ugly. The formulas are extremely complicated looking. And for that reason, in the basics part of this section, I'm just going to concentrate on the two variable case. So instead of one variable, two variables. Uh, the multivariable case is, is even worse looking. And we're not going to do any serious calculations of the error like you may remember from single variable calculus because just calculating the, the Taylor polynomials is complicated enough. So anyway, it's a very technically messy um, section, but it is what it is. So let's, let's quickly recall the single variable case. So f is a function of a single variable. What you want is you want to approximate approximate f well near some x near some specific x coordinate at least near x equals a um, and you want to approximate it well not just by you know f could be really ugly well you could approximate it by itself if you didn't care how ugly the function is but you want to approximate f well near x equals a by a simple function and simple for us I mean a polynomial. And hopefully you remember that if you want to approximate well near x equals a, it's a polynomial, which means you have powers of x. But it's actually nicest to write it a polynomial in powers of the quantity x minus a. Um, so the idea of the Taylor polynomial is, so the, the nth order, we'll just say the nth, no, no, we'll go with the nth order, the nth order Taylor polynomial for f. Center today A. Notation for it, a little cumbersome if you put in everything. You put the order here, F here, put that it's a function of X, but that it's centered at A, and there's a semicolon. Um, is the polynomial. So what is it? Well, let me just call it t, so I don't have to keep writing all of this, t. What is this polynomial? Well, you've got a constant plus some constant times x minus a plus some constant times x minus a squared plus, and you go up to the nth power. So it's something of this form. It would be an nth degree polynomial if we knew that this coefficient 
we're not zero, but we want to allow for it to be zero. That's why we say nth order instead of nth degree. Uh, sometimes we, we're a little sloppy with degree and we call this nth degree, just kind of tacitly assuming that Cn is not zero, but really you should try to avoid calling it degree. Um, so it's a polynomial of this form where what happens? Where the C's are chosen, to make all the derivatives to make the values of t of f and t and their derivatives Up to, up to the nth order derivative equal, equal at A. So this is the idea. Suppose you've got this complicated function f. You want to approximate it by some function, some more simple function t, some simpler function t. And you want the approximation to be good whenever x is close to a. Well, our idea is that what we do is we make f and t have equal values and equal derivatives at a, up to the nth order, at a. And it's our hope, it, that's not always true, but the function has to be pretty weird for this not to be true. It's our hope that by forcing the derivatives to be equal and the values of the function equal at a, that that makes the functions similar enough. And if you imagine the graphs, it would mean they pass through the same point, the slope of the tangent line is the same, the concavity is the same, um, if the first and second derivatives are the same. It's our hope, so the graphs should look pretty much the same. It's our hope that if we force all those the values of the functions and their derivatives to be equal at a, that it implies the functions are close together for x near a. And if you make that requirement, it turns out, well, there's only one choice of the C's. And it's not hard to figure out what they have to be. You just keep requiring that T and its derivatives match the derivatives of F at A. And what you find out is that, all right, well, C0 has to be F of A. And C1 has to be F prime at A. And C2 has to be F double prime at A divided by 2. And we write 2 as 2 factorial because it fits in with the general pattern. Because what you find is that the coefficient of the degree n term is the nth derivative of f at a divided by n factorial. And this is the nth order Taylor polynomial. Right, you can write this in summation notation. We write this as the sum as k goes from 0 to n of the nth derivative of, or the kth derivative of f at a divided by k factorial times x minus a to the k, where we are reminded that 0 factorial is 1, which seems a little weird, but, and by the 0th derivative of f, we just mean, well, don't take any derivatives, it's just f. So when k is 0, we mean you get the f of a term and then the rest of this. So this is what you do. These are the Taylor polynomials. And then the difference between the actual value of the function, if you take the value of the function and subtract the value of the nth order Taylor polynomial, this equals, we call it the remainder. It's a measure of how much error is involved. Actually, usually the error would mean the absolute value of this. We can give it notation r subscripted with an n, uh, superscripted with an n, subscripted with an f, xa. And what we want is that the absolute value of this is small, so that this remainder is very close to zero, so that this approximation is good. And you should remember there's a, a Taylor-Lagrange um, theorem about the remainder that lets you prove that it's small in certain cases. And finally, where do you get a Taylor series? Well, 
if, if the limit as n goes to infinity of this remainder is zero, well, what does that mean? It means that if we keep writing more and more terms, more and more terms in this polynomial, that this function, t, our Taylor polynomial, gets arbitrarily close to equaling the value of the function. And in the limit, they become equal. Well, then we say that f of x equals its Taylor series there. Um, and we write, and the Taylor series you should think of as just an infinite polynomial, a polynomial with an infinite number of terms. And we call that the Taylor series, the infinite series, it's a power series. We write the sum as k goes from zero to infinity of fk, the kth derivative of f at a over k factorial times x minus a to the k. All right. So hopefully this is what you remember from single variable calculus. If you really remember it, you probably remember a lot of ugly problems involving showing that the remainder is small or, yeah. Um, that's what we're not going to do in the multivariable case in this part of the section because it's just even calculating Taylor polynomials for multivariable functions is more problematic. All right. That's a quick reminder of what we did with one variable. What do you do in the multivariable case? Well, you essentially do the same thing. It's just, it gets pretty ugly pretty fast. <coughs> so I just want to, for the rest of this lecture, f will be a function of two variables. Yes, there's a Taylor. There are Taylor polynomials for functions of any number of variables, but it gets even worse than what we're going to do. And what is it you should want for, I mean, we'll have notation for it, so let's just look at what should we mean by the second order Taylor polynomial of f at x, y, I mean, in the variables x and y, but centered at a, b. So what should this mean? Well, it should mean the analogous thing that it meant in the single variable case. You should, have, you should have a polynomial that goes up to the second degree um, in powers of, well, now it's x minus a and y minus b. So we, you know, what we're trying to do, we want to approximate this well. Near a, the point a, b. All right, so you're going to have powers of x minus a and y minus b. Um, so what does t2 look like? So once again, I'll just call this t, so I don't have to write all of this. Well, we should have some constant plus a constant times x minus a plus a constant times y minus b. These are the first order terms, right? degree 1. But Notice you get an early complication here that makes things look much, well, already significantly worse than the single variable case. We had two terms, two different looking terms that have degree 1 if you ignore the coefficients. You know, x minus a to the 1, y minus b to the 1. But how many squared, how many degree 2 terms do you have? Three. You could have uh, an, an x minus a squared. You could have a constant times x minus a times y minus b. So, you know, there's a, if you, I think you should think of this as degree two. It has degree one in this, degree one here, but ignoring whether this is zero or not. Degree one, degree one, think total degree two, the sum of this degree and that degree. So, you, you know, you've got two variable, two variable expressions multiplied together. And then plus a t times a y minus b squared. So there are three squared terms, and as you can imagine, there are four cubed terms. If we wrote out t, the third Taylor polynomial, we'd have four cubed terms, and it gets very ugly very fast, unlike the one variable case where you just have one term of each degree. You have a lot of terms in higher degrees, which is part of the, part of the reason the formulas are complicated right down. But in theory, what we're doing is, you know, just as easy as it was in the one variable case. 
we want to approximate our function f well by something of this form. And we're going to say, all right, we'll make all the derivatives match at the point in question. So we'll make all the derivatives f, we'll make f and t have all the, have the same values and the same values for their derivatives at the point a, b. And now by derivatives, we mean, since we're looking at the degree two, or the second order one, we mean first derivatives, so those are partial derivatives, we mean we make their partial derivatives equal, and we make the second partial derivatives equal, and if we were going out to t3, we'd make the third partials equal, and you have to make, but how many partials are there? Well, three, I mean there's twice with respect to x, well, as we'll see, you have to do, how many second partials are there? Twice with respect to x, twice with respect to y, and then the mixed partial with respect to x and y. Um, we need, we want the mixed partial with respect to x and then y to be the same as y with respect to x. So we'll always assume that f is, well, is of class, so for instance for the second order one, c2, this means, i.e., has continuous partial derivatives up to a border less than or equal to 2. So, yeah, we could actually get by with a slightly weaker condition than C2, but it's so complicated to state how weak it could be. We'll just assume of class C2. All right. So that means that the mixed partial derivatives, the order doesn't matter, so that simplifies things somewhat. So we require the values of f and t and all of their partials. up to order less than or equal to 2 to be equal at a, b. Well, if you do this, it isn't, and I, I am about to do it, it's not hard to figure out what c, p, q, r, s, and t have to be in terms of the partial derivatives. So you get the Taylor, the second order Taylor polynomial. Let's do it. Um, I'm, not going to derive, I'm not going to derive it for the higher order Taylor polynomials. I'm just going to tell you what the formula comes out to be after we actually calculate an example. So, um, we're going to figure out what those coefficients have to be in the second order Taylor polynomial, centered at a, b. Um, so what we want, we need, we need, all right, we need f of a, b equal t of a, b. And I'm suppressing the t sub f superscript with the 2 and the, all the other notation. So what does this mean? Well, t, if you plug in a and b for x and y, well, if you plug in a and b for x and y, all these powers of x minus a and y minus b are 0, and you're just left with c. So you get that this equals c. So that means c has to be f of a, b. All right, what about the partial derivative of f with respect to x um, at a, b? Well, that should be the partial derivative of t with respect to x at a, b. But t is a polynomial. It's easy to calculate its partial derivative with respect to x. We get, we get p plus 2r times x minus a plus s times y minus b. And you evaluate this at a, b. So all I did was actually calculate the partial derivative of our polynomial with respect to x. So p, I'm just double checking, p 
plus 2r times x minus a times s times. Yes, okay. You plug in x is a and y is b. Well, if y is b, this is 0. If x is a, this is 0, and you just get p. All right, so that tells us that the constant p had to be the partial derivative of f with respect to x. Well, that was easy. Partial of f with respect to y at a, b is similarly easy. The partial derivative of t with we require the partial derivative of f to equal the partial derivative of t at a, b. But then we actually calculate the partial derivative of t with respect to y. You get q plus s times x minus a plus 2t times y minus b. Evaluated at a, b. Then this is 0 and this is 0 and you get q. Ah, so the coefficient q has to be the value of the partial derivative of f with respect to y at a, b. That's not too surprising. What about the second partial derivatives? We need the second partial derivative of f with respect to x at a, b to equal the second partial derivative of t with respect to x at a, b. Oh, what's the second partial derivative of t with respect to x? Well, here was its first partial derivative with respect to x. If you take its partial derivative with respect to x, again, you just get the 2r. <clears throat> so this tells us the coefficient r. r has to be, well, there's this 2, r has to be 1 half the second partial of f with respect to x at a, b. What do we get? Let me do this. What do we get for the mixed partial? The partial second partial of f with respect to x and y at a, b. This has to be, this has to be the same as the second partial derivative of t with respect to x and then y at a, b. This is the partial derivative with respect to, well, really y and then x. Um, we hit this with an x, you get just s. Or you could take the partial derivative of this with respect to y and just get s. So s has to be this second partial. And finally, I guess I'll just write it right here. In the same way you calculate the second partial derivative of f with respect to y twice will have to be, it's analogous to this, instead of getting 2 times r, you get 2 times t. All right. <laughs> What does all that tell you? It tells us what the second order Taylor polynomial looks like. Because we've solved for C, P, Q, R, S, and T in terms of the partial derivatives of F itself. And so what we get is we get it's F of AB plus partial of f with respect to x at a, b times x minus a plus the partial derivative of f with respect to y at a, b times y minus b and then all the second order stuff. So plus, um, plus one half, we have to divide by those twos, plus one half, the second, actually maybe I'll need more room, plus one half the second partial of f with respect to x at a, b times x minus a squared plus, there's no one half here, the second partial of f with respect to x and y at a, b times x minus a times y minus b and then plus one half the second partial derivative of f with respect to y at a, b times y minus b squared. All right. As I told you, the formulas in this section get fairly ugly. It isn't bad, though, and, or too bad, and hopefully you see the analogy with, with Taylor polynomials in a single variable. You have the value of f, and then with a single variable, then you would have f prime at a times x minus a. Well, instead, we have not f prime, but the partial with respect to x, evaluated at a, b, so that's a constant, it's really important to evaluate this at a, b. It's a very common mistake just to leave this in terms of x and y. Awful. You plug in the constants a and b um, <clears throat> times x minus a, and then you get 
uh, partial with respect to y times the same power of y, one partial derivative, one power of y. Then you have this half, and I will explain this in a, in a minute. Um, and here's the second partial that you're used to, f double prime of a over two factorial. Well, there's two factorial. It's maybe a little mysterious why it's missing here. But then two derivatives with respect to x, two powers of the x term, x minus a squared. Um, here you get one partial with respect to x, one partial with respect to y, and there's one power of x minus a and one power of y minus b. Here are two derivatives with respect to y and two powers of the y term, the y minus b squared. Um, in trying to make this analogous to the one variable case, we could pull out the half, and write one half times, so think one over two factorial times, and then, but then we have to put a two here, and then erase this. Um, I will come back to this, but right now I want to point out that there's a one, two, one, and if you recognize those, is the binomial coefficients, like you'd see in Pascal's triangle, like 1, 2, 1, and x, 1, 3, 3, 1. That is going to come up. That is what's going on here. But before I do that, I'd like to actually do an example using this formula. One of the problems is it takes up so much board space that this will cause us a little problem. But let me try to fit an example in over here. So. So, we'll do one that's not too difficult, but one that's interesting enough. Example. Find the second order Taylor polynomial of f of xy equals sine of x plus y plus x e to the minus y centered at 0, 0. All right. Because we're centering at 0, 0, that makes life a little easier for us instead of powers of x minus a and y minus b will have powers of x minus 0 and y minus 0, so just powers of x and powers of y. So that'll make things look a little nicer. Um, but aside from that, we just have to start calculating. So we, we need the value of f at the point in question. We need the values of its first partial derivatives, and we need the values of its second, of its second partial derivatives. And then we just plug into the formula. So what's f at 0, 0? Uh, that's the sine of zero, that's zero plus zero times e to the zero, well that's zero. All right, well that was easy. f at zero, zero is zero. Um, we need the partial derivatives. The partial derivative of f with respect to x at zero, zero. All right, the partial derivative of f with respect to x, the cosine of x, y, x plus y, plus e to the minus y. That's the partial derivative with respect to x. Evaluate at 0, 0. You get the cosine of 0 plus e to the 0. The cosine of 0 is 1. e to the 0 is 1, so we get 2. Um, all right. Uh, the partial derivative of f with respect to y at 0, 0. Partial derivative of f with respect to y cosine of x plus y again, but now minus x e to the minus y, evaluated at 0, 0. Well, cosine of 0, 0 is 1, then minus 0, so this is 1. And we need the values of the second partial derivatives. The second partial derivative of f with respect to x at 0, 0. All right, that's the partial derivative of the partial derivative. So the partial derivative of this with respect to x, we get a minus sine of x plus y. And then the partial of this with respect to x is 0. Evaluate at 0, 0. This is 0. The 
mixed second partial, second partial derivative f with respect to x and y at 0, 0. All right. You take our partial derivative with respect to x and take its partial derivative with respect to y. So we get, um, taking this and taking its partial derivative with respect to y, you get minus the sine of x plus y again. But then the partial derivative of this with respect to y minus e to the minus y. Um, and evaluate this at 0, 0. And you get 0 minus 1. You get minus 1. Um, just as a check, you could check that this mixed partial is the same as taking the partial derivative of this with respect to x. Yeah, you get a minus sine of xy and a minus e to the minus y. Good, good. And we have one. Last second partial to go, the second partial of f with respect to y at 0, 0. All right, well, here's the partial derivative with respect to y. We need the partial derivative with respect to y again. Yeah, it's not going to fit there. Let's. The second partial of f with respect to y is minus the sine of x plus y. And then uh, with respect to y, that's a constant. Uh, another minus sign will come down. A plus x e to the minus y. Evaluated at 0, 0. Well, this is 0, and then x is 0. So this is, so this is 0. So those are our calculations of the value of f and its first and second partial derivatives at the point in question. So they're num we got numbers. And after you have the numbers, you plug them in. So what are we getting? We are getting f at 0, 0. We're getting 0. Um, the partial of f with respect to x at 0, 0. We got 2. And a is 0. So here we just get 2x. b is 0. And the partial derivative with respect to y is 1, so we just get plus y. We got the second partial derivative of f with respect to x at a, b is 0. So this term is gone. We got the second partial derivative of f with respect to y at 0, 0, 0. So this term is gone. But we got that this one was minus 1, this second partial derivative. So what we end up with is that t equals 2x plus y plus a half times two times, we got that this thing was, min this mixed partial was minus one. And then a and b are zero and zero, so x, y. So what you end up with is the very simple 2x plus y minus x times y. Right? It's important that when we calculated the partial derivatives and the second partial derivatives, we evaluated them at point zero, zero. So what you end up with is a very simple looking polynomial, even though our original function was fairly horrible looking. Um, there's something else I should say. It's, you may wonder, you may not, but you may wonder, if you took the single variable Maclaurin series that you may have memorized for sine in calculus one, and the Maclaurin series for raising e to powers, and put those in here and wrote them out and collected powers of things, would you get the same polynomial in two variables? The answer is yes. You better. And you do. Um, but this is how you calculate it in terms of the partial derivatives using multivariable calculus. All right. That's, that's a fairly quick example of calculating a second order Taylor polynomial. Uh, this should give you a better approximation than just the linear approximation. Right? If we wanted to use linear approximation, we would just go out to the degree 1 terms, so we'd leave off this part. So that would be the linear approximation of f at 0, 0. But if we want, presumably, to have less error, to get a better approximation, we need to subtract this term. Um, all right. I want. Now that we've done an example of the second order one, I want to make, I need to make a definition before I can define kind of the nth order Taylor polynomial and certainly the Taylor series and the remainder. Um, so let me put back 
well, maybe I won't put it back. It's sitting right here, but it's got some slashes through it. This expression in the square brackets, you know, if we're trying to write something analogous to what you write in the single variable case, what we expect is first the value of f at the point a, b. That's analogous to just the value of f at a in the single variable case. And then, yeah, you have the partial derivatives of f with respect to x at a, b times x minus a, and the partial derivative of f with respect to y at a, b times y minus b. If we wanted to, if we wanted to kind of write more compact notation, more, we could write this. Notice that this is the partial with respect to x evaluated there, and the partial with respect to y evaluated there, times two things added together. Well, that's exactly the total derivative of f at the point a, b. And now it's evaluated on what vector? x minus a, y minus b. Right? If you look at the total derivative, right, it's you get it by taking the gradient of f at a, b, the gradient vector of f at a, b, and dotting with this. Well, that's exactly what this is. And for that reason, okay, and this is, you know, it's like in the single variable case, f of a, f prime of a. Oh, it's not f prime, but it's this first total derivative. And then evaluated here is, takes care of the powers of x minus a and y minus b. And here we see, a, oh yeah, and a 1 over um, k factorial. Well, that means we, might, we should kind of think of this as the second derivative. So in fact, we make that definition. We define the second order, to our, the, just call it the second total derivative. We define it to be, um, well, the notation for it, d, and then you put the number of derivatives in parentheses up there, at a, b, um, f, you apply it to a tangent vector, so or you apply it to some vector, which we're going to fill in with x minus a and y minus b in our formula, but right now we're just trying to define the second total derivative. And we define it to be kind of this creature with the x minus a and y minus b replaced by v and w. So we define it to be the second partial derivative of f with respect to x at a, b times v squared plus two times the second partial of f once with respect to x, once with respect to y at a, b, times v, w, and then plus the second partial of f with respect to y twice, evaluated at a, b, times w squared. That's our definition. Uh, maybe I won't write this dot here. So times v times w. That's our definition, and if we make that definition, we can certainly write this in more compact notation. This becomes exactly the second total derivative at a, b of f evaluated, replace v and w by x minus a, y minus b. Well, this sets us up to write a formula for the Taylor polynomials, just using higher order total derivatives. And then we have to, I mean, but we have to figure out what, you know, what does the third total derivative mean? And what the third total derivative means, if you write out all the degree three terms, and you know, so what should a degree three Taylor polynomial be in, in powers of x minus a and y minus b? So centered at a, minus, centered at a b. You write out all the terms of the polynomial with arbitrary coefficients, and then you require the coefficients to be such that all the partial derivatives are the same up to third order when you evaluate at a, b. And then you take that, the cubic terms and use that to define the third order um, 
the third order total derivative, the third total derivative. Well, if you do that, what you find, and I said the binomial coefficients were coming up, and I wasn't lying, that you get the same coefficients you get when you raise a plus b to a power. You get the binomial coefficients, those coefficients that appear in Pascal's triangle. So define the rth total derivative dr in parentheses at AB of F evaluated at BW. How do you define it? Well, it's it's a summation. And what you want is kind of the same things you see in, um, in the binomial expansion. So there are the, there are the, the binomial coefficients. We usually say r choose k. These are the things you see in Pascal's triangle. r choose k. And then you have the corresponding number of partial derivatives of f, which is always going to be r. But then, um, sometimes, some of them are taken with respect to x, and some of them are taken with respect to y. But the total number of them, the total number of derivatives you take is always the same as r. So when we're on the second partial derivative, understand, like when we're taking second partial derivatives, there are three of them. So the r is fixed at 2 when you're on the second partial derivative. But you need twice with respect to x and no times with respect to y. So that would be when k is 0. You need once with respect to x and once with respect to y. So if r is 2, that's when k is 1. And you need twice with respect to y and no times with respect to x. So that would be, if r is 2, that would be when k is 2. So that when, if r is 2 and k is 2, no partial derivatives with respect to x, but 2 with respect to y. This is evaluated at a, b. And you multiply by powers of v and w that correspond to the number of partial derivatives you took. So times v to the r minus k times w to the k. <laughs> I told you this would get messy. But that's what you get. Let me write out dr, uh, d3, the third total derivative, just so you can see what it is. So this means, for instance, d3 at a, b, and f, at b, w. It's just the coefficients from Pascal's triangle. So it, uh, if you remember, well, it goes one, you put ones here, and then you always, in each place, you add up the two above it. You put ones along the sides, along the slanted sides. And in each new row, you get the sum of things in the two positions above it. Um, so you get 4, 6, 4, 1 in the next row here. But in this row we get this. This, this means what you get in this next place. The coefficients go 1, 3, 3, 1. And you always are on third partial derivatives. So and then there's 3 times with respect to x at a, b. And then times v cubed. And then you get your coefficient of 3. It's always the third partial derivative of f, but now it's twice with respect to x and once with respect to y, which means you get two v's, two powers of v and one of w. And then your next coefficient, which is another 3, again the third partial derivative of f, but now once with respect to x and twice with respect to y, which means you get one power of v and two of w. And then finally a 1. times the third partial derivative of ah, da. These are all evaluated at a, b. This bad mistake to, to, for me to let you think for a second that you leave those in terms of x and y. They have to be evaluated at the point in question. And the third partial derivative of f with respect to y, evaluated at a, b, now times w cubed. So as you can see, it gets fairly unattractive, fairly rapidly. And that's just the third total derivative 
but what's the Taylor polynomial? All right. So, <clears throat> ah, and I should say we only do this, and I should have said it, we only do this, we need f is, we need for it to be continuously r differentiable, so we need f of class CR, so that means all its partial derivatives up to order r um, exist and are continuous. Okay, so <laughs> the nth order Taylor polynomial. So the definition T F N. So this is if F is of class C N or better. So it could be have more differentiability than the nth order Taylor polynomial is you can write a summation formula like we do um, like we do in um, single variable calculus. Uh, I've used r, so I'll go r equals 0 to n, and it's you take um, well, you take the rth total derivative of f at a b evaluated at x minus a, y minus b, divided by r factorial, this. So don't let this confuse you. So when r is 0, we say the 0th total derivative is just the value of the function at a, b. So you get f at a, b. And then you'll get, you get the first, the first total derivative, but we just normally write that as the total derivative. So um, evaluated uh, at x minus a, y minus b, divided by 1 factorial. We don't usually write that, but then you start putting in the, the factorials. 1 over 2 factorial times the second total derivative evaluated at x minus a, y minus b, and so on. You get plus a 1 over 3 factorial. What looks a little different, or <laughs> aside from having more variables, part of what should look different here is you don't explicitly see the powers of x minus a and y minus b, and it might look to you like clearly something's missing. Well, in a way that's good. It, you should think about it for a second. Right? In the one variable case, you see powers of x minus a. Why don't we see powers of x minus a and y minus b in this formula that I've written? The answer is that the powers are built into the definition of the total derivative, so that right, we see these powers of v and w. And then when we replace v by x minus a and w by y minus b, that means you get the powers of x minus a and y minus b as part of the definition of the total derivative. So don't let that confuse you that those powers seem to be missing here. They're kind of hidden inside the total derivatives. So this is the definition of the nth order Taylor polynomial. Um, as you can imagine, this gets very complicated, very fast, you know, third order Third, the third order Taylor polynomial is the highest I'd ever want to calculate by hand. Um, it's and with two variables. With more variables and higher order ones, it would really be bad. But while it's messy to calculate, it's, in a sense, it's easy in theory. Once again, you're looking for a polynomial, but now in powers of x and y, or really x minus a and y minus b. And you just make the coefficients be whatever they have to be to make all the partial derivatives, the values of the functions and the partial derivatives, match at a, b. So the theory is kind of easy. The formulas you get are what are disturbingly ugly. Um, and of course, you define the remainder. The remainder 
R N F X Y A B. It's the difference between the actual value of the function and the value of the corresponding Taylor polynomial. And what you want are theorems that let you prove that in various cases, that in various cases, this remainder is small in absolute value, so that it's close to zero. And we do have, there, there's a theorem that's just like you know, the Taylor-Lagrange theorem that you can use for this. And it's once again true, you say that f equals its Taylor series. And what should that mean? Well, it means that the infinite sum get, get equals the value of the function. So the limit of the values of the Taylor polynomials um, f equals its Taylor series, if and only if. So you write out all the terms, you write a formula for all the terms of every Taylor coefficient. Taylor equals its Taylor series, if and only if the limit as n goes to infinity of r n f x y a b is zero. So yeah, and of course it is. It, it is valuable to know sometimes that a function equals its Taylor series. Here's this infinite, infinite polynomial, polynomial of infinite degree that equals this more complicated looking function. So that can be theoretically nice. Um, I'm going to save that and the higher number of variables for the more depth portion. But before I leave this part of the section, I would like to go to the trouble to calculate the, the third order Taylor polynomial for the same example we used before. Now, of course, the first part is going to come out to be what we got it to be a few minutes ago. But let's you know, go ahead and do the, the third order part. So so we had, so we're back at this example. We had f equals sine of x plus y plus x times e to the minus y. Our point a, b, we were doing everything centered at 0, 0. Um, we, I could, this, the, well, we want, find t3. Well, <clears throat> which I'll just call T for sim simplicity. Of course, up to degree two, it's going to look exactly like what we found before. Um, 2x plus y minus xy. That's what we found before, right? Yes, 2x plus y minus xy. So, yeah, we could go ahead and say we know T2 equals 2x plus y minus xy, which means all we have to do is add the third order part to get this. This really doesn't save us that much time knowing this because we have to calculate all the third partial derivatives. And to calculate third partial derivatives, well, you need the second partial derivatives. So um, I am going to calculate again, but it's true that all we need to stick on to get T3 from T2 is the cubic terms, the terms involving um, powers of x times powers of y, where the total number of powers, so the, you add the coefficients of x and y, uh, the exponents of x and y, and you get 3. All right. Um, It's true. I could just appeal to the fact we already calculated the second partial derivatives, but it's not as though they're difficult to calculate. So let's just do it again. The partial derivative of f with respect to x is what it was before, the cosine of x plus y 
plus e to the minus y. I'm not going to evaluate that at 0, 0 because we already know what, you, what those coefficients come out to be. There's the partial of f with respect to x. The partial of f with respect to y is the cosine of x plus y minus x e to the minus y. Great. Um, which, of course, is what we found before. The second partial derivative of f with respect to x twice is now you get a minus the sine of x plus y. Uh, partial derivative of that with respect to x is 0. The second partial derivative of f once with respect to x and once with respect to y. I can take the partial of this with respect to x or the partial of that with respect to y. Either way, you get minus the sine of x plus y, um, uh, I almost messed that up, minus e to the minus y. Um, okay, you get that. The second partial derivative of f with respect to y twice um, is, you take the partial derivative of this with respect to y, minus the sine of x plus y, and then plus x e to the minus y. All right, so that's the second partial derivative of that with respect to y, twice. Okay, all right, the third partial derivatives. There are four of them, <laughs> so we just have to do it. Uh, the third partial derivatives, there are four of them. So the third partial derivative of f with respect to x, you take the partial derivative of this with respect to x, you get minus the cosine of x plus y. The third partial derivative of f twice with respect to x and once with respect to y. All right, um, here's twice with respect to x and now take its partial derivative with respect to y. Oh, we get minus the cosine of x plus y again. Yes, it's, it's the same. Um, the third partial derivative of f, but now once with respect to x and twice with respect to y. Um, so you could either take the derivative of this term. Uh, I don't know why I put that there. You could take the derivative of this with respect to y again and get minus the cosine of x plus y plus e to the minus y, or if you wanted, you could take the partial derivative of this with respect to x, you better get the same thing, minus the cosine of x plus y plus e to the minus y, right. And the last one is the third partial derivative of f with respect to y three times, which is the partial derivative of this with respect to y, which is minus the cosine of x plus y minus x e the minus y. Those are the third partial derivatives of f with respect, well, all the third partial derivatives of f with respect to x and y as many times, all the different ways. But we need these evaluated at 0, 0. So at 0, 0, this is minus 1. At 0, 0, well, this was the same thing, so this is minus 1. At 0, 0, all right, at 0, 0, this is minus 1, that's plus 1, so this is 0. And finally, at 0, 0, this is 0, this is minus 1. So 3 out of 4 of them are minus 1, but this one is a zero. All right, what does that tell us? Well, it tells us, so it tells us what the third total derivative of f at zero, zero is, and I can put in a, a v and a w. It tells us, all right, as I said before, you get the binomial coefficients. You get the binomial coefficients, so I go one, three, three, one, and then what you get is the third partial derivative of f 
at zero, zero times V cubed plus the third partial, ah, plus my binomial coefficient, then the third partial derivative of f twice with respect to x, once with respect to y at zero, zero, times v squared w plus three times the third partial derivative of f, once with respect to x, twice with respect to y at zero, zero, times vw squared, and then finally you get a one, third partial derivative of f, all of them with respect to y, evaluated at zero, zero, times w cubed. And then what we just found is this is minus one, so we get a minus v cubed. We found this one is minus one, so we get minus three v squared w. This one was zero, once with respect to x, twice with respect to y. That one's zero, so we don't see that one. And then this one is minus one also, so minus w cubed. So that's our, t <laughs> our third total derivative of f at zero, zero. And now, what do you add in the Taylor, in the Taylor polynomial? You replace v and w by x minus a and y minus b. Our a and b are zero and zero, so by x and y. So v, it'll look like v becomes an x and w will become a y, but we also need a one over three factorial in front of it. So what I'm saying is t3 is equals t2 of f equals whatever t2 was plus the next term which is a one over three factorial times the third deriv total derivative of f at 0, 0, evaluated at x minus a, but a is 0, y minus b. And so what we get is, we get this part is the 2x plus y minus xy. This equals 2x plus y minus xy, and then plus a 1 sixth, the 1 over 3 factorial, 1 sixth, well this thing but with the v's replaced by x's and the w's replaced by y's. So plus one-sixth minus x cubed minus three x squared y minus y cubed. And that <laughs> is the third order Taylor polynomial of that function. I warned you that the formulas in this section were ugly. The the fourth order Taylor polynomial, you know, a lot, lot more work. You, know, you have to calculate five fourth order partial derivatives and, and put those in. Um, and this is for only two variables. As you can imagine with a lot of variables and a, and a high order Taylor polynomial. Nobody would finish one of these problems. Um, and it's, if we were doing what we did in single variable, cal single variable calculus now, we do problems where we estimate the amount of error but it's already so complicated just to calculate the polynomials that I will save that for the more depth portion of the section.